All right. And while we're looking at the poll, I'll go ahead and um, just tell you all a little bit about me. So I'm Rochelle. I am based in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm a mom um, to a now 17 month old. Um, it sure does go fast. I um, have reiterated my career a couple different times, worked in management consulting for a time. Um, I was actually getting my master's in fashion journalism when I um, got pregnant with my son. Um, and I realized when I was pregnant with him that I actually have this, this passion um, for this very special period in our lives, transitioning from pregnancy into parenthood. Um, and just how, how sensitive that time can be, um, the emotions that can come with it, um, the roller coaster of a ride that it is, and realized that I was really passionate about um, supporting other women and new parents through this. So I um, dove in at the International Doula Institute on my childbirth education, uh, became a childbirth educator, and now I'm actually in the process of becoming a certified doula. Um, so labor doula and postpartum doula. Um, and I founded recently From Pregnant to Parent um, as a way to connect with people to provide um, coaching, childbirth education, and eventually uh, doula services. So I'm really excited um, to be here. This uh, discussion topic in particular um, is really near and dear to my heart and something that I'm really passionate about. So let's take a look. Um, at our poll. Looks like mostly in the, the second trimester towards the first half of the third trimester, but we've got folks on all across the board. Um, not a lot of plans to hire a doula. Really common. Um, I think we're still only at about 6% of births that have um, doulas. But seeing that the service is more and more on the rise, um, I'll be the first to admit that I, I wasn't really sure what a doula was um, when I was having my own son. And I just kind of always assumed that doulas were really just a big part of the home birth um, world. And it's, it's been really interesting to me um, learning and getting to know more about just how beneficial doulas can be um, and makes me more, more and more excited the more that I learn um, to see um, the, like, the usage of doulas on the rise. Um, looks like most, about 50-50 um, of folks who have taken childbirth education classes so far um, and folks who haven't yet but are intending to and definitely partners in the room and then kind of a mix of folks um, beyond that. So awesome. That helps just to kind of know where everyone's, um, where everyone's at. Thank you so much for sharing. So let's dive in. Um, we're going to talk about a couple different things while we're on the call today, right? That the topic of the call being how to be your own doula. Um, so we'll start with talking about, well, what even is a doula? What does it look like to work with a doula? Um, what benefits do they provide? And then dive into some of those things. Uh, so talking about, you know, how do I prepare for birth? Um, and how do I actually navigate and cope through those different stages of birth? And how do I be a really strong advocate for myself going through all of this and be a real active part of the decision-making process. So we'll start here. What is a doula? Um, so for those who aren't familiar with a doula, they are, um, a doula is a trained birth companion or a coach. Um, so basically somebody who has studied and learned the techniques of um, guiding you and supporting you through labor. Um, we are often surrounded by a whole care team, no matter where you're giving birth, there's usually a, a team of people around you um, medical providers, non-medical providers, folks that you've chosen to have in the room with you. Uh, but there is a lot of data um, and evidence that shows that having continuous, dedicated um, female support, in particular going through birth, has a lot of benefits. Um, the most beneficial being um, a doula, someone who's actually trained to support you through that. Uh, the evidence has shown that um, those who use doulas tend to have shorter labors uh, with less need for augmentation. Um, so things like the, the use of Pitocin needing to um, induce or speed up labor. Um, more spontaneous vaginal births, so meaning that birth is happening more um, naturally, um, 
I prefer the, the word physiologically, right? Like our, if our body's doing more what it's um, biologically, physiologically wants to do. So less vacuum extraction, less need for forceps, um, less C-sections, fewer requests for pain medication, and increased satisfaction with the childbirth experience. So maybe you didn't follow your birth plan to the T. Maybe it wasn't exactly the experience that you had planned for or that you had um, idealized, but you're able to look back on your experience with satisfaction. And fewer babies with low APGAR scores at five minutes after birth. So APGAR scores are that score where um, a baby is assessed at one minute after birth, and again at five minutes after birth um, to assess what, what their wellness looks like. So are they kinking up? Are they breathing? Are they crying? Are they moving? Um, it's one of the best assessments that we have out there just to, in that initial moments to assess how, how is baby doing um, in those first few minutes of life. So how, um, how does a doula do these things? How do we get these results? Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, the mentality and the mindset that they're able to help women find and use going into labor. Um, so especially in the United States, I think we've kind of created this um, idea that birth is something to, to fear, that it's scary and it's painful. And um, the more that we can combat that and, and feel like we can and we're capable and our bodies are made for this and birth is a natural thing, um, you know, something that, that we're made to do as opposed to something, you know, scary, a major medical event in our lives, um, the more that we can kind of go into it relaxed and ready to work with our labor and are seeing that that really helps when we can let go, when we can succumb to our contractions, um, it can help our body progress more effectively and efficiently. So how do we do that? Um, the first thing is just by being prepared. Um, it starts with, it starts before you even get into the delivery room. Uh, birth plans are the, is the term that we hear most often, right? Having a birth plan coming into, into the um, into labor and delivery, walking into the hospital. I much prefer the term birth preferences just because I think it helps with that mindset shift. Just by definition, a plan is a set of decisions about how to do something in, a, in the future. So it almost implies that, okay, if I come up with this plan, if I know what I'm going to do, this is going to have, this is going to be how it's going to turn out. It almost gives us this false sense of control. Um, we can't always predict what's going to happen in birth, um, but we can prepare ourselves. We can know what we prefer, what we'd like, what we'd choose, what we'd want um, in the event that we, you know, each time we run up to a decision point, um, you know, in the event that we have options. So, so what is it exactly um, to have a, a birth plan or to write out your birth preferences? Um, one of the best ways to think about it is as a communication tool. So it's just a way for you to align with your care team so that they know um, what are your preferences, what would you like, what would you choose, how can they best support you, right? If they know, um, if they know what your goals are, if they know what their wishes are, if you within if they know what your wishes are, um, then they can better support you and guide you and steer you in that direction. Um, they're, like I said, a guarantee. Um, or not a guarantee of a specific outcome. It's not a contract, um, really just a communication tool and also a framework um, to guide your preparation. It gives you a good starting point um, and a, like a good framework uh, to guide your research, to help you think about the different things that could happen, the different options that you might have available, um, such as uh, laboring positions. I think when we think of medicated versus non-medicated birth we think of with or without an epidural it's actually multiple um, options um, within that right birth positions i think we we tend to picture birth as you know on the back with the feet in the stirrups but there's actually a wide range of positions out there so just by sitting down and looking into it thinking about what would i want um, it really helps us to to prepare gives us a framework to, to research and to look into different things so why should I write them? Um, like I said, it helps so much with that mental preparation. 
of coming into this that just helps you envision what it could be like, what could happen, um, research your options. I think a lot of times one of the best ways to combat fear is um, by helping to, to address the unknown, right? For digging in deeper into the unknown. Um, you know, so instead of leaving things up to, to chance of like, well, we'll figure it out in the moment, um, sometimes it can be helpful just to feel like you're really prepared um, with options, possibilities, plan A, plan B. Um, they are also really helpful to confirm your expectations. Um, so when you're developing your, your birth preferences, it gives you, um, again, kind of almost a framework to have discussions with your care provider. Um, they can help kind of set your expectations. Maybe you want something that's actually not available at the place that you're um, giving birth. You, you do your research and you think, oh, I'd actually really like to labor in the tub and then come to find out that there's showers available, but maybe not a tub um, or maybe something um, that you would really like to avoid a standard protocol. So it gives you a chance to have these conversations with your care provider uh, to align, make sure you're on the right, the on the same page, that you're um, realistic in your expectations and confirm that you're really a good, a good fit for each other. Um, when should you write them? The earlier the better, but it's never too late. Um, I say the earlier the better uh, because just the more time you give yourself to put them together, the more time that you have to have discussions, to do research, to dig into things, but truly it's never too late. The more any time that you give yourself to think about these things, um, to dive in, to do the research, the better. And then the last part, how do I write them? Um, so one thing that a doula would do with you is actually sit down um, in a couple of appointments. It's different with every doula, um, but most commonly usually have a one or two kind of pre-appointments leading up to your birth where you'd sit down together and actually discuss and, and um, dive in to what are all the options. So you can find tons of different templates out there. Um, one page, many pages um, to really dive in and guide your own research. Um, attending a childbirth class is hugely helpful. Um, so if you, for those of you who haven't taken your class yet, I think about 50% of the folks on the call, this is a great thing for you to go into your class thinking about, um, and maybe as you're kind of taking notes, listening, and annotating, you can kind of start to almost build out your birth preferences of, oh, I really like that, that sounds really nice, that sounds really helpful, that sounds like something that I maybe want to go research a little more, that sounds like something that I maybe want to go discuss with my, um, my doctor or my midwife. A little bit further. Um, one thing that I would encourage everyone though is if you when you do write out this your birth preferences it might be this really long kind of exploration um, and and template that you end up filling out. When you go to your hospital I think one thing that you can do um, again to just kind of set up one thing that you're your doula would likely encourage you to do um, and to kind of set yourself up for success once you walk into the room and is um, have a short list ready. You know, what are those few things um, that are really important to you? What are those few things that um, you know is really like kind of a personal preference thing? So for instance, if, if you are a person who really um, knows that you would like to have the, the lights low and maybe um, quiet voices, maybe not a whole lot of side conversations and that, that can be kind of distracting for you. That would be something that would be really wonderful to, to put on your list to share um, with your, your nurses, your care team when you first get there or um, kind of earlier on in your labor to align you. Um, I can kind of pause there and just check in the in the chat before we dive forward. Any questions on birth plans or preferences? We'll have time at the end for, for questions too, but I just want to um, check in. Okay, we'll go ahead and dive forward. So that would be the first part, right, of, of being your own doula, of, of getting yourself really prepared and participating in your labor um, is being prepared. This next part is being really familiar with the stages of labor. Uh, so I think that's one of the, the really wonderful things that um, a doula can do for you. And if your care team is aware that this is something that you want 
that you're familiar with that you know if this is a way that you want to cope and manage with your labor um, they can kind of help really uh, communicate and keep you updated with exactly where you're at in your labor um, so being familiar with the stages of your labor just helps you to kind of have milestones that you're reaching for when you're going through um, you know kind of destinations to get you to say okay I've crossed this next um, I've reached this next milestone, this next checkpoint. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've made it onto the next one. And it kind of helps to break up this, what can feel like this really long process of labor and childbirth. But if you're just kind of making it to the next checkpoint, sometimes that can help make it a little bit more manageable, just biting off one piece at a time. Um, so the first one stage that we want to be familiar with is that pre-labor. So this is um, this is that false labor that happens, the Brex and Hicks contractions. Um, they're non-progressing contractions. So that's how the, you, know, you really know the difference between I'm in pre-labor versus, okay, this is really happening. Um, we're, we're having a baby. Uh, pre-labor kind of comes and goes. You might have some contractions. You jump in the shower and they stop altogether. You're having some contractions and then you go to sleep. Um, wake up the next morning. This happened to me a few times uh, before I had my own son. I remember one night in particular, I kind of said to my mom and my husband, I was like, this is it. Like everyone, it was like nine o'clock at night. I'm like, okay, everyone, like, let's, let's get to bed. Let's get some good sleep. I'm feeling these. I'm certain that these are them. Like they're going to start progressing. Like I bet I'm going to be waking you guys up in a few hours and it's going to be go time. And I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning so disappointed um, because it was the next morning and I had had no contractions and they had stalled out in the night. So that was pre-labor. Uh, they're still hugely beneficial because they're preparing your, your uterus. They're preparing your body. Um, for what's to come, but they aren't progressing. They're not actually dilating. When we say progressing, they're not dilating contractions. Um, your contractions exist to actually help pull your um, cervix open and then to help expel the baby. Um, so when our contractions actually start progressing, that's when we go into dilation. And so dilation is that period, it's actually broke, that's broken out into the three phases which we'll look at a little bit closer here in a second, but this is that this is the actual progressing contractions where you're actually dilating um, and opening up. This can take anywhere from two um, to 24 hours once you're actually in it. Um, and you're going to do the first part from home and then um, eventually move into the hospital or your birth center, um, or, you know, call in your, your midwife if you are laboring at home um, to finish this out. Like I said, we'll, we'll dive into this in the next um, slide and really look at those phases. But pre-labor, dilation, now I'm opening. Once I'm open, I'm fully dilated. We move into birth. And this is when our baby's actually born. Um, about 15 minutes up to three hours or more is what you can expect um, for, for this stage. If you do um, get an epidural, this tends to be the portion of the birth that's really prolonged the most, um, just because it can interfere with your efficiency in pushing, I mean, your ability to really like push with, um, to, to like kind of feel your body wanting to push, feel your body needing to push, um, and work with your body to push that baby out. Um, once the baby is out, next comes the placenta. So this is something that, that women don't always know um, comes next. So once I push that baby out, I'm not quite done pushing yet, but the placenta delivery is much, um, much easier than the birth of the baby. Um, usually happens around 10 to 30 minutes afterwards, and then you move into your recovering and bonding period about one to two hours afterwards. Um, so like I said, why does this matter in terms of actually coping with my labor, managing my labor? When we know what to expect, when we know what those stages are, it gives us checkpoints, it gives us milestones to work to. The phases of labor now, so this is where, where the phases of dilation, um, right? So we've gone from pre-labor, we're into dilation, getting ready for birth. My cervix is actually opening, is broken up into three parts. So um, early labor, active labor, and transition. Now, one thing that I think is so important for everyone to know is that 
each stage is going to be shorter and more intense, but more effective than the last stage. Um, so one thing that can be really helpful is to keep in mind is that even though the intensity is ramp ramping up, it's going to be a shorter phase than the last phase. So for instance, um, you know, early labor, if we think about it, this is when we are typically, we're talking, we're maybe laughing, we're cracking some jokes still, we're going with the flow. Early labor, you wanna do at home for as long as you can. Um, so if you know that you can still, you're still laughing, you're still talking, you're still going, maybe you're feeling them, but you know, you're, you're feeling them and you can more or less kind of ignore your contractions, maybe we're filling up the freezer with some meals for afterwards. Um, if it's during the day, maybe, you know, you're going out to um, lunch, going out to take a walk, maybe popping in a movie, um, popping in a movie like we all have VCRs. Um, <laughs> that you know there's you're you're doing things where you can kind of distract yourself um now you might be using coping techniques in this you might be feeling them um a little bit more and you know you might be starting to think about um especially if this is your first time labor and you haven't really felt those true active labor and transition contractions you know you might already be kind of di diving in on um some breathing techniques maybe some of the positions that you learn in your childbirth class um, but for the most part, you can kind of talk through this. Um, active labor, a really good sign that you're, you're into active labor is usually you really have to focus in on that contraction. Um, you usually don't appreciate the, the jokes being cracked anymore. Like you have a contraction and it like kind of knocks, stops you in your tracks where you have to stop, focus in, really breathe. Um, through it and kind of actively manage that contraction. Um, early labor, um, the that like centimeter milestone um, varies a little bit depending on who you talk to. Somebody will say that it's three centimeters. Um, usually the hospital won't admit you until you're at least at three centimeters. Um, but it's really six centimeters to eight centimeters is is um, tends to be that true active labor. Um, period. So one thing that I um, would love for everyone to keep in mind going into your labor is whether you're planning to have an epidural or not, um, you should plan to labor without it for as long as possible. Uh, sometimes um, when we get epidurals too early, it can um, feel less less effective because you don't have that perspective of feeling what like really true hard contractions feel like. Um, so then an epidural isn't like a, you know, completely wipe out all pain. You'll still feel your contractions a little bit. Um, but if you've only experienced some light labor contractions, you might feel like your, your epidural is not really working. Um, because you're, you know, they kind of feel the same way all the way through, but in actuality, they're becoming more intense or becoming more effective. So the longer that you can wait and kind of cope um, and let your body work and kind of work with your body and, and cope without that medication, the more effective that, that epidural will be down the road um, if you decide to get it. Um, this also just gives yourself a chance too to see maybe you, maybe you just um, are afraid of the pain, you're afraid of the fear, and once you get into it and you see that you're you're capable and you're able to cope maybe you won't need it or you can put it off much longer um, than you had originally planned to um, another thing is if we get it too early that's typically also when we see that it's prolonging um, labor so try to push if you if you want an epidural there's great instances for epidural um, for people who really have a hard time just like letting go and releasing and giving in um, it can, can really initiate um, the fear tension pain cycle so we're, we're afraid of the pain so we tense up and that actually makes the pain more intense which gives us more fear makes us tense up more gives us more pain um, so if you're just really having a hard time letting go, it can be really wonderful for that. Um, but work with your body as much as you can. This is one thing that, that doulas are really phenomenal at, is just working with you to, um, you know, if you do get to that point where it's feeling too much, reminding you, you can, let's change positions. Let's try something else. Let's maybe go take a long shower. Um, 
to help combat that pain. And one thing that I want um, you all to keep in mind too is when we are um, physiologically coping with birth, our bodies are producing natural pain responses. So our body is producing oxytocin. It's a huge component of labor of actually, you know, signaling your body to contract um, and to give birth. But oxytocin is, it's that feel good hormone. It's um, that, it's the love hormone, the sex hormone the, um, that makes us feel good. Uh, so it's actively helping us actually deliver this baby and it's also actively helping us cope. Um, so the less we interfere with that, the more that our body's natural pain coping mechanisms can kind of kick in. Um, so you're not completely without pain medication. Your body is naturally going to help you um, cope with that. And so when you can work with that, um, it, it, you're, you'll, you might be surprised to see how well your body is actually able to help you get through this. Um, so active labor, shorter than early labor. Um, early labor, you might be in for, for hours, um, maybe even the, you know, the better part of a day. Um, going into this active labor, um, you can expect to be in typically around four um, to eight hours, and then transition um, like about 15 to, to 60 minutes. Um, so it's really going to, like I said, as you go through, you're really going to see phases become shorter because your contractions are getting more, more effective. All right. Um, once we get through that transition, that'll be the toughest part. But if you make it to transition um, without pain medication or even with pain medication, you make it to transition and you are close. You are doing it. Um, and then you get here, we're ready to push. Some women will experience a resting phase when we get to pushing, um, where you're, you'll actually have a lull um, while your, your baby has shifted down and your uterus is kind of readjusting to baby's new position and you'll actually maybe get a 10, um, 10 to 20 maybe um, minute lull as you, before you move into descent. Um, but descent is when you actually feel that your body tells you you get this um, urge to push. Um, a warm compress can be, be really helpful for this to help you direct your push and also just to support your, your perineum. Um, and then um, baby kind of takes two steps forward, one step back, two step forward, one step back while we're going into descent. And when they're finally officially, their head is no longer retreating, we're officially crowning and then baby comes through and, and um, you're giving birth. So 15 minutes to three hours, sometimes longer, especially if it's um, if you've had an epidural. Um, but a lot of women uh, find that this is actually their, their favorite part of labor because you actually feel like you're doing something. You feel like you are making progress, um, you know, like you're actively pushing this baby out um, and it can feel like kind of a relief um, to get here. So what can I do during these different phases? Um, keep in mind, you're probably going to cope a little bit differently through each phase. Um, so like I said, maybe in early labor, you're coping more through distractions. You're walking, you're laughing, you're maybe watching a movie, you're, um, you know, maybe putting the last couple things in your hospital bag or, your, you know, your birthing bag. Um, one thing that I highly recommend through all stages is working with gravity and moving as much as you can. So the more that we're moving, the more that we're, our pelvis is actually able um, to kind of help baby shift and drop and get ready and move into the ideal position. Um, going into labor, you know, getting that head just right on the cervix, um, you know, help really working with our body, working with those contractions. Um, the, so that's one thing that we really want to keep in mind all through is, um, is keep moving, keep standing. You know, maybe that looks like on all fours, um, moving our pelvis around. Maybe it looks like laying in, um, laying in bed a little bit. Um, 
doing some figure eights or some pelvic tilts, uh, leaning on the side of the bed, dancing a little bit, maybe swaying, doing that the junior high dance with your partner, um, or even just walking. You know, walking is really great. Um, so in, in early labor, it might look like a lot of that sitting on the ball, bouncing on the ball. As we move into active labor and we start to get more um, intense, this is where things like hydrotherapy um, can be really helpful. So hydrotherapy being in the tub or in the shower, and you can even, you know, all fours in the shower and having that um, water has just been proven to be a really helpful um, non-medical pain relief. Um, you can just help us relax, help us to cope, um, you know, so if, even if there's not a birthing tub, thinking about jumping in the shower, you know, even just like 45 minutes in the shower uh, has proven to be really helpful. Um, if your partner is with you uh, in the hospital, they can, you know, throw on a bathing suit and um, jump in there with them. But, you know, even if you're, if for whatever reason, you're, you're, it's just you and your nursing team, um, you know, these are all things that you can do on your own, you know, sitting on the, the birthing tub, reminding yourself, like, if you just feel like, you know, holy cow, this is, how am I going to get through that next contraction? Change, change positions, um, change your approach, change what you're doing, um, you know, move what's happening. And when you're, you're going to want to change contractions, it's going to be between, or change positions, or change your approach, change the way that you're coping is going to be between contractions. Um, so once you get into that contraction, especially as they progress, you're just going to be focusing in on just that one contraction. I'm just getting through this one contraction. Um, and really, every contraction is going to build up, it's going to peak, and then it's going to kind of start to come back down. So your period of coping is really just going to be that peak. Um, so if you can just focus on riding the wave, right? I'm going to just give in to this contraction. I'm going to, as I feel it building, I'm just going to ride it up. I'm going to, you know, give in to this. I'm going to work with my body. I'm going to feel this contraction. I'm going to get through the peak and then I'm going to ride it back down. Um, the more that we can do that, the better, you know, working with our bodies, not fighting our contractions, not resisting them, but actually, you know, succumbing to them, um, the better that we tend to be able to cope. Um, the less it actually kind of signals those, those pain reactors even. So once we ride through that con contraction, we get to the bottom, that's when we can reassess, okay, what do I want to do for the next contraction? Take a breath, get a sip of water, you know, maybe take a, a bite of a granola bar, um, some dilute Gatorade or juice or um, something like that. Breathe, reassess. Do I want to stay in this position? Do I want to go into a different position? Do I want to maybe sway a little bit while I wait for the next one and then, you know, lean against the, the bed and dive in for my next one? Um, a birthing ball can be wonderful. And again, you can just sit on that birthing ball between in the contraction, maybe move a little bit through the contraction. A rocking chair, um, sitting on the toilet uh, can even be a really beneficial position. You know, you're, you're squatting. Um, on the toilet. Um, again, knowing that stage of labor, knowing that phase you're in so that you have a checkpoint to get to so that it's not just this overarching, you know, huge chunk of labor of getting to birth, but actually knowing the, the stage and the phase that you're in. Asking questions and then some things that you can do um, even with limited support is, you know, put up some, if you're, um, if you like encouraging phrases, if you have uh, positive affirmations that you feel like that really work for you, post them up in your room so that you have them um, to look at and to remind you, or maybe you want a, an actual image of a baby um, up there for, if you're not a first time mom, you know, maybe having a, a picture to remind yourself, like, I can do this, I've done this before, um, I'm capable, and that might be helpful. Um, essential oils, um, having them on a, like on a cotton ball where you can just kind of take a, a smell if that's something that typically relaxes you. Um, music, either something relaxing or motivating, um, depending on what feels good to you. Having a focal point, so something that like that's where I look, you know, when I'm in the, the midst of a tr contraction, I just want one, one point to kind of focus on. That's where I dial into while I'm going through um, and coping. Uh, string lights or battery-operated candles can help to set a really calming and relaxing atmosphere along with maybe limited or low talking. Um, maybe that's something that doesn't bother you at all though. You know, you're not distracted at all 
by what's happening over here, you're really able to just like focus and get in the zone. So you're not really worried about that. Um, either way, warm and cool compresses. So maybe a warm compress on your perineal, a nurse um, can certainly help with this. Um, or you can ask your, your doctor or midwife as you're delivering to apply that counter pressure. Um, apply a warm compress um, just to help support your perineum, to give you a place to focus your pushing um, and to help support your perineum from tearing. Um, light touches and massage, um, you know, something that you could even maybe think about um, in yourself, especially in that, that early labor, light touch, even nipple stimulation can sometimes help us to protect, to um, progress through labor and encouraging words. So if you know that there's something that, hey, I, I really like to hear this, I really like to be talked to like this, um, that's something that you can put in that um, the short list of birth preferences for your, your care team, for your nurses, um, even with limited support. You know, if we know these are the things that we like to hear, this is the way we like to be talked to, um, you know, this is the, the ways that we tend to cope with stress and difficulties in our normal day-to-day -day life. That's something that you can really um, communicate and share with your with your nurses, with your care team, so that they can better support you. Um, even if you're not able to have all the people in the room with you uh, that you were maybe originally planning to. Um, and the last thing real quick before we jump into questions, I like to just bring this up um, as a way to, to help you feel confident in navigating um, any questions or decisions that you run into through birth. Um, I can send you all a link to this where you can dig into deeper, dig in deeper, but a big part of um, having that dual in the room is that sometimes they're just able to be an advocate for you and help you to think through and make decisions. Um, I really like this framework of the brain. I think it's really easy to remember of if I'm making a decision, I'm using my brain. Um, so know that it's okay to ask questions when you're going through. And, and this is a, a way that can really help you make those decisions. So you come up to a crossroads and the doctor asks you, do you, well, do you, I want to do, um, do we want to break your water bag, for instance? The first thing you could start out by asking is, well, what are the benefits um, of doing this, either for me or my baby? So that's the first thing, B for benefits. Um, you know, why would we want to do this? And then asking, well, what are the risks? Um, you know, why would we not want to do this? Are there any alternatives to doing this? Um, listening to your intuition and your gut, trusting yourself and knowing that, you know, if your gut is telling you one thing, listen to that, bring it up. Don't be afraid to voice that. You know, you don't need to, to um, you don't need to stuff that down and defer to the, the experts in the room. You're the expert of your body. You're the expert um, of you, you know, so it's okay. Feel empowered. Know that it's okay to ask questions. Um, and then, um, Shweta, let's come back to your question. I see your question in the chat. Um, let's dive into that in a sec. But intuition, right? Listen to yourself. And then, and what happens if we don't do anything? Um, you know, so knowing that that's perfectly okay for you to ask is, well, I, um, I hear you, you know, that we're suggesting this. We've talked about the benefits. We've talked about the risks. We've talked about the alternatives. I'm not sure if I'm fully on board with this. So what if we don't do this for the next five minutes, for the next hour, for the, you know, never, what if we never do this? Um, so just know that, you know, it's, it's okay um, to speak up. You should be an active part, an active member of your care team. You're not just the central focus of it. Um, I think sometimes just having this framework, just having a way to, to defer back to, I think in the moment when we're making decisions, it can be, it can kind of feel overwhelming. Um, you know, the, we're, we're, our, our minds are focused on our contractions, our minds are focused on coping, our minds are focused on getting through labor. Um, so if we've maybe role played some of this, thought about some of this, um, feel comfortable with this framework going into um, labor, then we can feel more comfortable in the moment. Um, if a question does come up, knowing, great, I know how to talk to my doctor about this. I know how to ask questions so that we can come to a decision together that I feel really comfortable with. Um, so we are going to dive into a little Q&A. Um, I am going to give you all of these in that um, recap email that I'm going to send out after this, the follow-up email that's going to go out after this um, so that you have it, my email, my website, um, ways to connect with me on social. 
uh, so that we can keep in touch. Um, so please know that if we don't answer your question in here today, or if you come up with a question later, um, you can absolutely reach out to me. There's multiple ways to find me um, afterwards. Um, so let's dive in on, on some questions. Uh, Shweta, am I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm so sorry if I'm not, feel free to, to correct me. Um, but what are some of those labor positions is what, what she's asking. Um, lying on your back is not always the best um, position. It's the most common position. Um, my understanding of why it became this really common position to labor in is just because it's a really easy position um, for someone to deliver you in, but it's not always the best position because it doesn't always put your pelvis in a very optimal position um, for the baby. And you're also tend to be kind of fighting against gravity. Um, when you do have an epidural, you don't always have a lot of options um, for alternate positions because you aren't able to be up walking around. Um, you are essentially a, you know, a quadriplegic for the moment. You're kind of paralyzed from the waist down. Um, can't really feel or use your bottom half, but just something as simple as raising the head of the bed, putting some pillows back there, and getting your getting um, your top half elevated so that you can work with gravity um, can make a big difference, you know. And then from there, even like pulling our knees up to our chest. Now, when we pull our knees up to our chest, um, sometimes. The, the natural feeling, I, I pull my knees up and I want to kind of throw my head back, but you want to keep yourself tucked in. Um, you can even feel when you do that, right, that my, my energy and my, um, my strength is kind of coming up, but if I could keep my, my head tucked in, my shoulders tucked in, working towards my belly, it, able, it really enables me to kind of get more here and here into pushing. Um, so if you, um, for those that haven't had a, a baby before, when we think of pushing, what does pushing feel like? Um, you know, how do I push effectively? You can think about um, kind of when you, when you throw up, you know, that hook and that, the way that you kind of tense here, that's kind of where you're pushing from. Um, we also think about, you know, push like you're pooping. Um, people are so um, nervous, first time moms especially, are really nervous about pooping on the table. And it's, it really is true that if, if, you are, if you poop during labor, it's a really good sign that you're pushing properly and that you're progressing properly. And anyone else in the room is gonna see that as a sign of progress, that you're pushing effectively and that baby is coming. Um, if you're worried about pooping on the table, don't, because it's only gonna hold you back from pushing really efficiently and effectively. Um, just release, let it, like, let it go give into it um, and, you know, work with your body. Um, no, like I said, no one else in the room is going to um, care about that. They're only going to view that as a sign of progress um, and that you're doing it right. So um, push like you're pooping, you know, like and you want to get it out. That's kind of what, what pushing feels like. A couple other um, labor positions is a really popular one is all fours. So hands and knees. Um, that can be really effective position for helping baby kind of get through the lip of the pelvis um, and out. That's a pretty optimal position um, to labor and deliver in. Um, on your side is another um, really wonderful position for delivering um, birthing stools, you know, actually sitting and squatting. Um, you can actually deliver your baby from that position. Um, babies have been delivered while women sit on toilets before even, you know, just being in that squatting position. Um, and then as far as laboring, similar thing, laboring on all fours, uh, laboring, leaning on the bed is a really popular one. Um, swaying, that, that junior high style, you know, arms around your, your partner, room there for belly, um, you know, getting those hips going, just kind of swaying um, with your partner. And, you know, not swaying from the knees, really swaying from the hips. You really want to get that moving that pelvis um, so that you're really helping to work baby through. Almost think of it like, you know, wiggling a, a cork out of a wine bottle or something. You know, you kind of, we're wiggling, you're twisting. Um, that's kind of how baby's coming through your pelvis um, for labor. So we're just helping him, helping, helping that baby to, to ease in there, to drop into the pelvis and then um, work their way out. Um, 
so actually, you know, sitting on a, a ball or in a rocking chair is a great labor position. Um, you know, so just kind of sitting there and, you know, maybe bouncing a little bit, tilting a little bit, pelvic tilts forward, back, side to side, figure eights um, with your pelvis. I think one of the, the biggest things, try a bunch of different labor positions, feel them out. Um, having your, if you do have your partner in the room with them, you know, having them actually climb into bed with you and support you um, from the back is, a, is an option. Um, or supporting you, you know, as you're kind of squatting and sitting down on the, um, on the floor. Um, but play around with them. Try some different positions before you go into labor. And then once you're in it, um, you'll kind of have that in the back of your mind of, of things that you can go back to. But just listen to your body. Just feel your body. It might feel weird. You might like, feel like, I don't really know why, but my body really wants to be on its side right now. Or, um, you know, I don't, I don't really know why, but I, I want to like get up. I want to move. I don't want to be, I don't want to be stuck in bed. Um, listen to your body and uh, just try to look, try to go where it goes and then, you know, try it for a contraction. And if you get through a contraction and you're like that, that didn't work, I feel like there's a better way to cope with this. Try something new. There's um, no reason why you can't keep, can't keep trying different things. And you can ask your, um, ask your nurses in the room too. You know, they're, they were, um, been around for a lot of different labors, so they've seen a lot of different positions. Um, another great thing to talk about with your care provider before you go into birth is, will there be any restrictions on positions that I can labor in and positions that I can deliver in? Um, what, what are my options? Will you be supportive of walking around, staying vertical, moving in and out of bed? Um, awesome, glad that was helpful. Okay, another question. I have very fast labors. My baby came three hours after my first contraction. I feel like I was in transition not long after I got to the hospital, born less than one hour after getting there. How can I deal with them wanting to check me in, give an IV, and asking questions when I am um, progressing so quickly, struggling to keep my anxiety down and focus on labor? Um, I had a rapid labor myself, um, so I know... Um, I know that it can sound like a dream and feel like a nightmare um, because it, it can be really hard to keep um, to keep up mentally with what's going on. Um, I think one thing that can be really helpful is having this discussion with your care provider in advance to talk about what are some of the things, you know, do I have to have an IV? Um, not having an IV you can do a couple different things. Um, there's actually a couple benefits to not having an IV. I mean, then you're not you know, you're not strapped to that. You have more freedom to to move. You know, talk to talk to your care provider about you know can we can we actually avoid this in case I actually you know don't need it. Um, it helps that you have delivered before, so you can have kind of a more productive conversation of like, listen, we know that I have rapid labors. Um, you know, so. So how can we kind of streamline this process? I think one thing that can help is just that's, you know, have your short list or have your, 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 your script kind of more or less ready to go so that when you are checking in, you know, it's, hi, I'm, you know, hi, I'm, I'm Brittany. I'm, I have rapid labors. Like my last one went really fast. Um, you know, this is where I'm at and being able to really clearly communicate, you know, these are the, the contractions I'm having. This is how fast they're coming. This is how far apart they are. Um, you know, this is how quickly that, that we've, um, progressed and like, this is what I need right now. Um, you know, and, and speaking up for yourself and not being afraid to speak up for yourself and say, Hey, this is what I need right now. Um, you know, or, you know, how, how quickly can we get to, to this, um, you know, how, how much can my partner do of the checking in and just having that game plan with your doctor because uh, things are going to kind of vary a little bit from hospital to hospital, from birthing center to birthing center. Um, so I think the big, the biggest thing is just feeling really comfortable asking questions, um, advocating for yourself and sharing what you need. I hope that's helpful. And you can always reach out to me and we can kind of talk about that, that one in particular a little bit more one-on-one um, -on -one, because I know, like I said, I know that that, can, that anxiety um, is real and that um, rapid labors can, can actually be um, a very difficult thing to kind of process and mentally kind of stay on top of. Um, the other thing that I would add too, I think is just um, 
I think when it, it's going really fast, having those checkpoints um, can be equally as beneficial. So maybe just sharing with your nurses and sharing with your team and asking them um, to really keep you in the loop of where you're at in your labor um, so that it can, you know, you can kind of give you a better chance to, to mentally keep up, you know, and kind of know where you're, know where you're at. Um, that might be another thing that's, that's really helpful for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely can relate to how, how rough a, a rapid labor can be. So def feel free, please uh, reach out if you, if you want to chat through more. I'm more than happy to. Even just venting and relating, uh, I know that can be helpful. Any other questions for me? We've kind of gone over time a little bit, but I don't mind hanging around for um, a few more questions. All right, looks like that might be it. Like I said, if you come up with questions, if you think of something later, um, definitely feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna follow up. It'll take me, um, usually takes me a couple hours just to, uh, for the video to process, um, do a little bit of um, editing and then get it uploaded. Uh, so it'll be a, a, probably a couple hours before I send that email out, um, but I'll get it out to you all before the end of the day. And that'll have my contact information, um, the link to the recording where you can come back and revisit. I know this is a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, and then um, my um, a, a link to a survey so y'all can provide some feedback so we can kind of keep um, making sure that these are productive. I just saw one more question come in, Kendall. Um, don't know if this is relevant exactly. I live an hour and 15 minutes from my hospital, first pregnancy. Um, you know, they typically tell you to wait until your contractions progress. How long should I wait to leave? Um, so an hour and 15 minutes is, uh, I mean, most people aren't gonna, um, you're, you're gonna be in early labor uh, for hours and you should still have time, even in active labor, most people are in labor for four to eight hours. Um, what I would say is if you feel like you're, you, if you're in early labor and you feel like your contractions, you know, start timing those contractions, start paying attention to them. Um, and they, you seem to be progressing really quickly. Um, they, you know, feel free, start heading towards the hospital um, or the birthing center. Um, it's going to kind of depend too on like what time of the, of the day it is. You know, if it's during the day that you feel like you are making progress, you are getting there, you are in early labor, why not just start heading towards the hospital? You can always, or, or a birthing center, wherever you're giving birth. Um, but you could always, you know, just plan to head that way, um, grab a bite to eat, maybe, you know, do some walking around um, in that area maybe do something close by um, just in case. But on average, you're going to be in early labor for hours and you're even going to be in, in active labor for, for four to eight hours. Um, so for the, the vast majority of people, you're going to um, be glad that you waited until you are, um, you know, done as much of that early labor at home and come into the hospital, um, you know, checking into the hospital, your nurses are really going to want to see you like, kind of like slugging it up to the nurse's station and then like I'm here these are my contractions are are you know this far apart and this progressing and like hold on I gotta get through this one like you know Ed, like taking everything that you got as opposed to like hi I'm here yep I'm in labor I'm ready we're excited like let's do this um you know so so more often than not if um this is a great one to talk to your um, to your care provider about in particular. Um, they, they might have some good ideas for you too about, um, you know, just maybe they would prefer that you come in and, and maybe do some laboring in the waiting room. Um, there's kind of like a couple different things um, that you can do, but, but I will say, um, you know, for most people, even being an hour and 15 minutes away from the hospital, you're gonna have time um, to wait until you, you're really progressing and it's taking some effort 
Um, you know, maybe you, you don't wait all the way until you're like, I can't talk through this. Like I'm, I'm absolutely an active labor, you know, but like, they're really like, give yourself time until they're, they're like, they're really strong. They're really getting there. You've had some time to, to know that they're sustained. Um, the other thing too, is just knowing that you're like, if you're, if your water breaks, you're going, you know, like don't, if your water breaks, that's a, that's a whole different story. Um, and you're going to want to start making your way there. Um, I wasn't allowed, Saniha, I think, is that how I pronounce it? I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong. Um, I wasn't allowed to eat anything but ice chips with my first pregnancy. So we're starting to see this um, change more and more. Um, the, 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 the data supports that it's more beneficial for a woman to get a little bit, some light um, nourishment during pregnancy than, um, than not eating at all. But it, it's kind of a kind of an old school approach um, to just do the ice chips. Um, and it's, it's because of a concern with um, if you have to go under anesthesia, the concern is that you could aspirate. Um, so, and you're, you're probably not gonna wanna eat a big meal anyways, you know? So the, definitely don't eat a huge meal once you're in labor, like get something in your stomach, you know, eat a sandwich, you're in early labor, you know, you know you're getting there, have a sandwich. You know, have something, get some nourishment in your body, whatever whatever sounds good to you to eat, get that nourishment in there before you go into the hospital. But once you're in the hospital, this is a great thing to talk to your care provider ahead of time. Um, if you want, I can even send you some some articles and, you know, some some data and stuff that, that you can kind of walk in and have that conversation with and, and feel kind of supported by. But um more often than not, the advisement now is to let women, at the very least, have um, some diluted juice, diluted Gatorade, popsicles. Um, you're again, you know, you're gonna probably not feel like eating something huge, but keeping that like your electrolytes up um, and keeping some amount of nourishment is 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 found to be so much more beneficial than depriving women because we need that energy. This is the, the hardest workout we've ever done in our lives. We need that energy to get through this. Like, you know, ice chips don't, ice chips don't cut it. Um, so yeah, um, reach, reply back to my email when I send it out. Um, and then I'll send you over some stuff so that you can have, you know, to kind of help you facilitate that conversation. But it's, it's worth having that conversation. Um, it's definitely something that that is being more widely accepted is to get you some nourishment, get you some, even just some light calories, you know, some electrolyte replenishment to get you through labor. Yeah, no problem. Both my hospitals allowed me to have the normal hospital meal, uh, but it did come back up. Yeah, so something to keep in mind. Definitely a great point, Andrea. That's that's why um, usually we say you're, you Stay away from the big meal because you are, you're likely to come back up because there's a lot going on down there. Um, that's great though, that your hospital was supportive of you pretty much having like, you know, eating whatever felt good, but just goes to show that more, more and more, that's kind of what we're seeing is, is that it's on you. But yeah, eating something big is probably not going to be something that you want to do because it, it is, um, that is pretty common for it to come back up. Um, but you know, light, uh, at, like I said, at the very least, some dilute juice, some Gatorade, popsicles. Popsicles are a really great one because, it, you know, um, if, they, if they're if they hesitant, popsicles might be a nice happy medium because um, it's more or less ice chips, but at least you get a little bit, you get some sugar in there to kind of help support your system and keep you going. Jello is another kind of happy medium. All right, I think we'll go ahead and um, end the call. But like I said, I'm, I'm here. Reach out anytime. Um, I'm available for for one on one support and coaching as well. If you need any support with developing birth plans or talking through in more detail different labor positions, um, you know, talking through and game planning more specific to your um, to your situation, um, you know, based on your hospital policies and rules as as far as support and who's allowed in the room, um, more than happy to, to brainstorm with you more individually on how you can support um, yourself or, you know, maybe you were planning to have a doula and now you're only able to have your, your partner or maybe you wanted your partner and, and a sister or a friend or, um, 
you know, somebody else in the room, a family member, a mom in the room with your partner, um, and you want to just brainstorm a little bit more, um, you know, how can I, what can we do as a partner? How can my partner and I be prepared so that he can support me or, um, or she can support me more effectively, more efficiently now that I'm not, you know, going to have as many people in the room. But, oh, I'm so glad this is helpful. I, I love to hear that. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll get this email out to you um, so that you can come back and revisit so that you have my contact information. Um, you should be able to just reply back. If you've got a, a burning question or something, you don't want to wait for the email, you should just be able to reply back to the emails that you've gotten that had the meeting room information, the, the event reminders. Um, so if you don't want to wait, you can reach out to me that way. Um, but I'm so appreciative of you all for joining. I, I love having the opportunity um, to support you and, and to provide to provide some of this the information so i'm so glad to hear that it was helpful um thank you all for taking the time uh, to join me and i'm sending you all well wishes and happy thoughts for for wonderful satisfying um childbirth experiences and i'm here hopefully i'll be connecting with and seeing you all again have a wonderful day